Hello, my name is Sergey Melnik, and this is the Test of Time Award presentation at VLDB 2020, which I am giving on behalf of my co-authors. This talk is accompanied by a full paper with the same title that you can find in the conference proceedings. I'd like to start by thanking the VLDB Awards Committee for selecting our paper. This is the screenshot of the original publication. In that paper, we describe DREML, a distributed system for interactive data analysis that was developed at Google and first presented at VLDB 2010 in Singapore. That same year, Google launched BigQuery, a publicly available analytics service backed by DREML. Today, BigQuery is a fully managed serverless data warehouse that enables scalable analytics over petabytes of data. BigQuery took off to become one of the fastest growing services in Google Cloud. But beyond commercial success, what is it about Dremel that stood the test of time? Rereading our 2010 paper, we found that the main principles used in Dremel align very well with the technology trends highlighted in the recently published Seattle report on database research. In fact, some of these principles turned into major industry trends and are now considered best practices. This is what this talk is about, highlighting Dremel's key ideas and architectural principles, which are SQL, disaggregation, in situ analysis, column storage for nested data, and serverless computing. The retrospective paper in the proceedings has more details on the historical background, evolution of these ideas in BigQuery, and other topics, such as dealing with query latency. In the early 2000s, the conventional wisdom at Google was that SQL doesn't scale. And Google had moved away from SQL almost completely. Dremel was one of the first systems to reintroduce SQL for big data analysis. Dremel's SQL dialect included some critical innovations, notably first-class support for nested data and hierarchical schemas. This allowed very fast execution of queries over pre-joined data. The ability to interactively and declaratively analyze huge data sets was a key enabler for many successful Google products over the next decade. Over time, virtually all data platforms have embraced SQL, SQL style APIs, both at Google and in open source. However, all of the systems had their own SQL implementations and dialects, which was confusing and bad for users. For example, consider this query from the VLDB 10 paper. It looks flat syntactically, yet surprisingly returns a nested result. To address this complexity, we started a project to unify on one new ANSI compliant SQL implementation we could share across all SQL-like systems. This framework included a common parser, compiler, and algebraizer, a library of SQL functions, and a reference implementation demonstrating correct behavior. Its source code is available on GitHub. One key lesson we learned while building this framework is that while there is an ANSI standard for SQL, it is of limited use in practice. Since the standard is underspecified and lacks key functionality, every engine must make its own decisions on how to extend it, and which mutually contradictory precedents from other products to follow. For engines, this adds tremendous complexity and ambiguity when implementing SQL. For users, this means SQL is never truly portable across engines, and there is high risk of lock-in. We, we solved SQL portability at Google, but it remains an industry-wide challenge. The next principle behind Dremel I'd like to talk about is desegregation. Initially, Dremel ran on a few hundred shared nothing servers. In 2006, when the project started, it seemed the best way to squeeze out maximal performance from an analytical system was by using dedicated hardware and direct attached disks 
A major shift happened in early 2009. Dremel was migrated to a cluster management system called Borg. Moving to manage clusters was essential to accommodate the growing query workload and improve the utilization of the service. Yet it exposed one of the challenges of using shared resources. The spindles used for Dremel's data were shared with other jobs. Consequently, we switched to a replicated storage organization where a portion of each table was capped on three different local disks and managed by independent servers. Our replicated storage system started to have more and more overlap with an existing core piece of infrastructure. Google's distributed file system, GFS. It took a lot of tuning to migrate Dremel to GFS, which affected its storage format, query affinity, and prefetching. In our initial experiments, using GFS was an order of magnitude slower than local disk. But eventually, Dremel on desegregated storage outperformed local disk, both in terms of latency and throughput for typical workloads. Shortly after the VLDB 10 publication, Dremel added support for distributed joins. It was inspired by the MapReduce shuffle and utilized local RAM and disk to store local intermediate results. However, the tight coupling between compute and shuffle storage proved to be a scalability bottleneck. Continuing on the desegregation path, in 2014, we built a new shuffle infrastructure which supported completely in-memory query execution and had an order of magnitude better performance. In the new shuffle implementation, the RAM needed to store intermediate shuffle data was managed separately in a distributed transient storage system. As a result, today, most of BigQuery's RAM is desegregated and accounts for about 80% of the total memory footprint of the service. During the last decade, desegregation proved to be a major trend in data management, as it decouples provisioning of different types of resources and enables better cost performance and elasticity. Storage desegregation has been embraced by analytical and transactional systems alike, including Spanner, Aurora, Snowflake, and Azure SQL Hyperscale. One interesting takeaway from Dremel's desegregation journey is that a resource can be desegregated effectively by packaging it in a value-added service, as we did with main memory and shuffle. The next principle is in-situ analysis. In-situ refers to accessing data in its original place. In the VLDB 10 paper, we described how we packaged the storage format used in Dremel as a Google internal library. This format has two distinguishing properties. It was columnar and self-describing. Each file storing a data partition of a table also embedded its metadata, which included the schema and derived information, such as the value ranges of columns. This self-describing columnar format made it possible for the data management tools at Google to interoperate through data it became possible to write a MapReduce job whose result was instantly queryable by Dremel without any data loading. Later on, Dremel expanded its in situ support via additional file formats such as Avro, CSV, JSON, and federated access to other systems such as Google Cloud Storage, MySQL, and Bigtable. Rolling forward the clock, we find the data management community in the middle of a transition from classical data warehouses to a data lake oriented architecture for analytics. Similarly to in situ analysis, this transition focuses on eliminating traditional ETL based data ingestion, consuming data from a variety of data sources and enabling a variety of compute engines to operate on the data. We found that a pure in situ approach has several important drawbacks. First, there is no opportunity to either optimize storage layout or compute statistics. Indeed, a large percentage of Dremel queries are run over data seen for the first time. Second, it is impractical to run DML updates and deletes 
or DDL schema changes on standalone files. Third, and perhaps more importantly, users do not always want to or have the capability to manage their own data safely and securely. While this extra complexity in data governance is acceptable to some degree inside Google, it is not tolerable for many external customers. These issues led to the creation of BigQuery Managed Storage, which offers an API with many data management features which complement in situ access, such as compression, clustering, geo-replication, and DML. As a takeaway, combining the strength of in situ and managed storage seems to be an interesting path for innovation and standardization. The fourth principle I'd like to touch upon is columnar storage. While the idea of columnar storage was well known in 2010, the journal paper spearheaded the use of columnar storage for semi-structured data. <clears throat> Nested data was and continues to be used extensively at Google in virtually all applications, search, Gmail, Maps, YouTube, etc. The VLDB 10 paper introduced a so-called repetition definition coding, which I'm going to illustrate on the next slide. Over the following years, several open source columnar formats were, for nested data were developed, including Parquet, which cited the influence of the journal paper, ORC and Apache Arrow. ORC and Arrow use different encodings for nested and repeated data, which we refer to as length presence and offset presence. Let me illustrate some key differences. This example is borrowed from the original journal paper. It shows a nested scheme on the left and two sample records on the right. Each record has a required field doc ID and a repeated field name, containing another repeated field language with nested string fields code and country. Here is how these two records get encoded. Repetition definition representation is on the left, length presence is on the right. Let's look at the country values. In both encodings, those are stored as vectors of literals, US and GB. In Dremel's encoding, the nested structure of the country values is captured using two integers. Their values range between zero and three here which is the nesting depth of the field in the schema. These repetition and definition levels are sufficient to answer any query on country, for example, to compute the average number of countries per language. In contrast, in the length presence model, the nested structure of the non leaf field's name and name.language is encoded separately. That is, all of them need to be read when country is accessed. So which encoding of structure is superior? Well, it depends on the metrics. These metrics include the total size of the encoded data, number of seeks needed to read a column, and the availability of efficient query evaluation algorithms that operate on the encoded data. For example, somewhat surprisingly, it turns out that the length present encoding is more compact for typical deep and wide records used in Google's data sets. More work is needed to quantify these trade-offs. Yet structure encoding is only one part of a columnar format. Over time, Dremel incorporated most published compression techniques used for flat columnar data. One design choice that turned out to be important for performance was to embed a mini query processor into the format library. Its job is to evaluate SQL predicates on compressed data. Our embedded query processor supports various optimizations, including partition pruning, vectorization, skip indexes, and predicate reordering. As a result, all engines that operate on columnar data, such as F1, Parcella, Flume, and BigQuery Managed Storage API, can benefit from efficient data filtering. This is especially important when filter predicates are very selective. In fact, 14% of queries in BigQuery select no data at all, 
The last principles, principle, which undoubtedly stood the test of time, is serverless computing. Since the early days, Dremel was multi-tenant and provided on-demand resource provision. This was necessary for scaling to thousands of internal users at Google at a low cost. Elasticity of the service benefited a lot from disaggregation. To support multi-tenancy, Dremel introduced abstract units of compute and memory called slots, which were well suited for a container-oriented compute environment. Initially, scheduling was done separately on each individual server. After the VLDB 10 publication, Dremel continued to involve its serverless capabilities. A new centralized scheduler now uses the entire cluster state to make scheduling decisions, which enables better utilization and isolation. A fixed tree of servers used in the early days was replaced by a custom execution DAG constructed for each query. Moreover, after each shuffle stage, execution gets adapted based on the properties of the intermediate results. With these changes, the query process itself has transitioned towards using serverless components internally. This is the end of my talk. There's more material in the retrospective paper on dealing with query latency, which I wasn't able to cover. My co-authors and I are grateful to hundreds of engineers who made significant contributions to Dremel in the intervening years. They put the system in the hands of users outside of Google and enabled us to write this retrospective paper. Thank you for listening.